My name is Marta Sarellas. I'm senior quantum engineer in Kilimanjaro Quantum Tech. It's a startup um, that we do full stack quantum computing from the very low level of the hardware and its control to the very high level of the applications and the algorithms. I come from a diverse background. I'm a chemist by training. I'm also a computer engineer and I also have a master's in quantum chemistry. But then I moved to do my PhD in theoretical physics with a focus on on quantum computing. Um, I moved from academia um, two years ago now, and it's my first time, my first role in industry. Wow. Um, sorry, my jaw hit the floor at the idea of you going from a PhD, uh, a master's in quantum chemistry to a PhD in theoretical physics. I just have no idea how you managed to do that because that must have been a tough switch. Yeah, it was, it was quite tough, but uh, while, while I was doing my quantum chemistry master's, I was working in research for my, my final project in simulation of, of molecules. And actually now this is one of the more awaited applications of quantum computing, right? The simulation of, of materials, the simulation of drugs for drug design, and to be able to like more efficiently find target molecules to, to, be, to be put into the lab for the development of new, new new medicines. And I was working in that direction. I was working with the simulation of um, reactions that would scavenge the, the, the oxidant effects of, of certain components in the body. And this is very important because this is related to um, several diseases like Parkinson or Alzheimer and so on. And I was doing this simulation of finding, trying to identify which molecule helps reducing these this oxidant, these oxidant molecules. And my, my simulations would take like a week in a big supercomputer or two weeks. It would take forever. And sometimes they wouldn't even finish. And they were, they were quite small molecules. So imagine if you want to start exploring larger systems, this becomes untreatable. And then I heard from um, about quantum computing. And I started hearing uh, some, some conversations in the university or in the in, on the internet and so on. And um, I also realized at the same time that I, I had a big passion for computers. And that's when I decided to move to computer engineering and also try to pursue a PhD uh, that would allow me to end up doing quantum computing in the long term. And it was quite hard to find a PhD that would accept a chemist uh, for doing that, but at the end, uh, Eventually, everything worked out, and I'm very happy I took this decision. I mean, you must be really pushing boundaries here. You know, you're at the frontier of research because even the struggle to go from chemistry to quantum computing and theoretical physics is because that research doesn't exist, and you're there to do it. Well, yes, and it's, it was interesting. All of a sudden, it was an opportunity in, in the field because um, it was identified that chemistry, quantum chemistry was uh, one of the most, um, the bigger potential application of quantum computing. And also, they also needed experts in, in computer science. So I, I managed by accident to have a mix of, of the three components of the field, both uh, of physics, a bit of chemistry, and a bit of, of computer engineering. So I like to say that I'm not an expert of anything, but I know a bit of everything. So this is, this is what I like. This gives me different perspectives, I guess. And it, it came out as a good opportunity. I mean, quantum computing and quantum technology is so new to a general public that um, I don't think, first of all, we really have a grasp of how it works. And we therefore don't understand why it's going to be useful to us. So you are working on making quantum technologies useful and, and applied. Um, you know, why is it so essential that quantum technology is involved in your research? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, well, quantum computing has been shown in the theoretical part to be very uh, 
to be a, 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 a potential, potentially a very good technology to solve problems that do not have solution at the moment, as I said before, to speed up calculations such as chemistry or material discovery and so on. This has been, um, th this is a, 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 a beautiful idea, but at the end of the day, it's still a theoretical idea. So we haven't seen this advantage, this quantum advantage being implemented for any application. And one of the reasons why we haven't seen this is because the technology is quite um, immature. It's still quite immature. So we still need to, uh, many years of development, even though that we uh, are working like um, from, both from the industry and academia, they are pushing uh, uh, the technology very, very fast. And, and we've seen advances that are, are and milestones uh, very big milestone achieved in the last in the last decade, but um, it's still quite far from being from being useful. It still needs many years of development. But in the meantime, we already have uh, what what, we, what what I would call prototypes that are of decent size and of decent um, that allows for decent control of the of the of the qubits or of the components of, of the quantum chip. That uh, we can already start thinking. Uh, making ourselves the question why what this could be useful for. So we know that once we have bigger systems and the technology is much more advanced, we can do amazing things in the area of chemistry, in the area of optimization and cryptography and so on. But what can we do with what we have now? And what can we do with what we will have in the midterm? So can we start uh, profiting this better? And, and this also comes in line with the fact that there were not so many experts in the field that would uh, spend some time thinking about these applications. They would spend some time thinking about the physics fundamentals of it, but um, not about what can we do with this. And that's why it's so important that uh, this technology now is moving from academia to companies. Because when you are in a company, you need to commercialize the product. And if you want to commercialize, commercialize it, you need to target the clients. And if you want to target clients, you need to know what clients and what for. So it's now that we are starting to ask ourselves the question, why could this be useful for? So it's a technology with enormous potential, but we are not sure what to do with it. Um, so this is uh, where the point of interacting with clients, with different stakeholders in different communities, in different fields, both in academia, both in industry, uh, both in education, can, can have very interesting uh, results. So we are actually asking the questions, how can quantum technologies help us, right? That's where we're at. We're, we're, we're in the thick of asking these questions. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. We are, we are at, this, at that stage of, of finding uh, the, the great application that will revolutionize the, the use of, of quantum computing in, in, in that field. And we are considering many options. So uh, some people more focus on optimization problems. Uh, some people focus more on quantum chemistry, on, on encoding strategies for for or, or quantum cryptography or decoding strategies to break classical cryptography as well, the other way around. Um, but there's still no, no killer app, I would say. So we are still uh, wandering around and it's, it's an exciting time because we, we still don't know what is going to be uh, the preferred application of, of this, these devices. Maybe there might be many. Um, one question I had for you is that... Um, the media can often just try to um, summarize uh, these kinds of technologies into one-liners. Um, mm -hmm. So often people think of quantum computing as being a way of computing that's really super fast and can handle lots of data. Um, does it really boil down to something that basic or is there more to it than that? Well, it's hard to um, explain this in just one line or one small article that it's intended for for general audience. So I understand it's uh, it's often difficult to to put things in 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 simple and short words, but. Um, the truth is that it's much more than that. So we cannot say that quantum computing is going to change the, the technology in our houses or that we're going to start having quantum uh, cell phones or quantum computers at home, personal quantum. It, it, it is not like that. So um, quantum computers have the potential of uh, speeding up certain type of tasks, but not all, not all of them. So we, we have a very good... Uh, 
technology, classical technology of computation. And this is an achieved, uh, an amazing achievement in terms of, of technology and it has revolutionized the society as, as, as we know it. And it's not realistic to think that quantum computers will, will change that. So quantum computers will be able to target specific tasks that are very, very small and, and present in just certain type of problems, such as maybe some optimization problems or some um, simulation problems. But the general tasks that we see uh, on a daily basis when we browse on the internet or when we want to use our cell phone will remain um, being done by classical computers. So we need to, I think we need to think about quantum computing as some sort of accelerator in the same way that you, you can see the GPUs accelerating uh, a computation that typically are done in CPUs. We, we are going to see a quantum computer or quantum processing unit accelerate the, the some tasks that take part in, in, a, in a larger uh, computer and uh, what I think and what many think that's going to be the house of this type of technology is going to be um, supercomputing centers or uh, big um, data centers and infrastructures that have um, high performance classical computers and they will also offer this type of accelerators for their for their computations in general yes it will speed up calculations that's that's the hope but we are also um, at the moment, we are also exploring other, other benchmarks, other metrics that could uh, actually uh, be taken profit uh, from quantum computing, for example, the sustainability and energy consump consumption. So we know that uh, these data centers and these um, supercomputing centers are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And this means that they consume more and more and more energy. So one, one, one of these centers consume like a, the, 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 the same amount of energy as a as a, as a town, as an entire town. So um, asking ourselves the question of whether we can find uh, computer paradigms that consume less energy or that are more, more sustainable is also very important. And, and we are on, uh, actually now investigating this possibility of whether the advantage of quantum com computing can also come from this, this energy consumption. So is it the case that the type of uh, problems that a quantum computer could tackle are problems that tend to have a lot of unknown factors all working together. Like this isn't a case of A plus B or, you know, uh, linear uh, processes or questions. This is a, would quantum computing tackle those kinds of problems that have loads of different um, factors involved? Yeah, that's that's right. So we, we have a, a let's say a linear simple problem. We don't need to go to quantum computers, right? So it's, it's what a little bit of what I was saying before. You don't need to reinvent reinvent the wheel. We already have very good machines that can solve these problems. The problems that are uh, especially uh, useful to be solved by by a quantum computer are the ones that require exponentially large uh, amount of resource. So uh, 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 these problems that need to uh, explore all the possible variables, all the possible paths for the solution, uh, a quantum computer is good because a quantum computer, as you know, has an exponentially large space of, 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 of exploration that you can, you can benefit from. So usually those are tasks that uh, require exponential um, resources for the number of variables that, that they have. So they are very costly problems. So focusing in on what you actually do, like what's the main aim of your work? So at the moment, I'm um, leading the theory, theoretical efforts of, of our company. So we are working on the development of, of algorithms and on the fundamental advancement of, of the technology in terms of theory. So we, we have like two main pillars. One is we work with clients and we help them become quantum ready. So there's a lot of hype about quantum and clients and, and the different industries are becoming to, to hear about that and wonder themselves, okay, can we use this technology or what is this technology about? So we help them understand. So we, we, we are making an effort to democratize 
the technology and make sure uh, the industry and the stakeholders understand what is the point, what is the stage at, at, at which we are at and what can we do realistically with what we have. So we don't want to oversell. We don't want to contribute to this hype. We try to be as honest as possible to explain what is technology about and, and to assure them, to reassure them that they are not uh, getting behind and that they, and we help them to be at, at the same stage as the technology is advancing. And for that, we also implement proofs of concept. We, we help them migrating a problem that they have, that is, they don't have a very efficient solution. We help migrate the problem into a quantum algorithm. And we develop a quantum algorithm to target uh, their, their, their specific problem and uh, of course the the devices that we have at the moment are still quite small and we are working towards the development of our own hardware to to target more complex problems but what we can do with what we have is to have small proofs of concept with a limited with the simplification of the problem they have in terms of number of variables and so on and try to uh, implement this uh, quantum algorithm that we have uh, tailored to their problem into one of these specific uh, prototypes of quantum computers that different providers uh, offer. And um, other than that, we also work on the more in, in, in research and development side of working towards the uh, development of uh, the analog model of quantum computation. The analog model of quantum computation is a different paradigm of quantum computing than the typical one that, that we've seen almost everywhere. The, the, by typical one, I mean the gate-based model. The gate-based model is the one that consists of quantum circuits. So you have your qubits and you apply a sequence of, of gates and then you measure your system and, and that's your computation, right? So in the analog model, we work um, in a different way of encoding the problems. You can encode your problem into a, uh, what is called the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian boils down to the way your chip is parameterized. So the way your interactions between qubits or your local fields that you can implement in your chip are put together. So you can actually encode optimization problems in a very straightforward way by tuning the parameterization of, of your chip. And this is a different way of doing computation. And it has the um, potential to bring, and that's why we believe on it, it has the potential to bring applications in a shorter time frame than the gate-based one, because uh, the gate-based one is very faulty in terms of errors. Quantum information is very, is very sensitive to disorder, to the um, environmental noise. And the gate-based is even more, 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 more uh, sensitive because every time you apply a gate into your, in, the, in your circuit, you introduce an error. A control error that keeps adding up, adding up, adding up, adding up until the end of the, of the circuit. And if the error has been too large, then you cannot make any sense out of your, of your measurements. Um, the analog model has the potential of bypass the need of, of uh, implementing error correction codes. And these error correction codes are required for the gate-based model. And the issue with these codes is that they are uh, they rely on redundancy and redundancy means that you need to put many qubits together. You need to engineer chips with many qubits in order to encode one logical unit of, of quantum information. So it's very similar to what we do with classical error correction codes. You encode the same um, information into many, into many memory bits. And then if one error happens in one of them, you, can, you still can retrieve the information by measuring the other ones. So it's very similar, but with quantum information and with quantum computing, this becomes much more challenging in terms of, of hardware. So that's why they expect this to be more or less 10 years apart. From, from achieving it. And in the meantime, we think the analog-based quantum computing is capable of bringing uh, interesting applications for this, for this shorter time frame. Wow, uh, I think you lost me um, yeah. very early on Sorry. in the explanation. And the reason why I got lost is because um, what you're discussing is so advanced in the development of quantum computers. And I thought that there was actually a race in just trying to figure out the best way to get a qubit to function. Like there are many 
basic, well, basic kind of ways. Um, you know, you've got the super, you've got the, um, the photonic method, you've got the super cooled method. I mean, what you've just described, is that like several uh, levels ahead in terms of research? And if if so, can you just kind of give me a real whistle stop tour of where we're at, where we come from? Okay, so uh, one thing is not incompatible with the other. They are just two different things. So one of them is the architecture, like the, the qubit architecture that you use. That's the, your hardware. And this, as you say, you have uh, many, many proposals and none of them is still a, a favorite one. So we still don't know uh, which one is best. Some of them present uh, their advantages, but then they also have their drawbacks. And uh, examples of them are ion traps, uh, photonics, um, MB center, superconducting qubits. We are, we are actually working with superconducting qubits, um, but there's still no um, preferred implementation for for, for the hardware. Um, I would say that uh, one of the most ex ex extended ones in terms of, of research and in terms of uh, startups working on that is, is superconducting qubits, superconducting devices. But now we've, we, have, we are starting to see also a lot of uh, work doing with ion traps. And the only difference is the way you encode your qubit. So it's a different system, a different experimental setup that encodes your qubit in a different way. Uh, that's the that's the difference. Uh, now, what I was talking about before is the that there are not only different ways of um, encoding qubits and doing the hardware, but there are also different ways of doing computation. And by doing computation is is the paradigm that you follow the, the way you control the, uh, the the system and the way you encode your problem into your into your chip. And you could do what is called the digital control which is the gate-based and the circuit-based control. Among, there are different ones, but the, 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 the main one is the, the gate-based. And then you have the analog uh, model, which would be this, um, this one I was mentioning, that you can encode the problem into the chip instead of encoding the problem into the sequence of control gates that you apply to your, to your system. So they, they are very different paradigms. And as the architectures, they also have different uh, advantages and drawbacks. And, and one of them, that is what I was explaining, is um, the need of error correction codes. To, to protect them and correct the errors that happen during the computation. It's safe to say that quantum computing has many layers to it, right? It starts with the hardware, there's the software, and then actually there's um, the client. Um, what kind of conversations are you having with clients today? Like, are clients convinced they need quantum or maybe clients see that it's essential to have quantum technologies as part of how they function? You know, where where is the thinking at today? I think I think the way they see it is that they, they are starting to um, foresee a technological revolution. And they are seeing uh, many of their competitors uh, investing in, in this technology, at least in, in understanding what it's all about. And even creating their own um, teams working on that. So some of some of the big banks already have their their quantum engineer team working on this migration of the algorithms into into the quantum algorithms. Uh, so I think that what they see is that they want to be ready. They want to be quantum ready for when uh, this, the first breakthrough uh, happens. And it's, it's so difficult to predict when this is going to happen that they just want to be around and they just want to be ready and at least know what, what we are talking about, because we, we need to keep in mind that this is very um, technical field. And uh, we still haven't, we, we are just moving it from away from academia and, and starting this, the, the, the first startups and companies working on it. And it's still not so widespread in, in, the, in society and people, it's quite new for everybody. So it's very important that we, we make an effort to, to make sure that people understand what, what's all about and, and 
it takes a lot of responsibility because we also need to avoid this this hype that happens when people don't fully understand what the technology is about. Yeah, it's kind of mind blowing that it is new, but it's actually not new because Einstein was talking about how weird quantum phenomena is. Um, and so why now? Why, why, why are we having this conversation now? Well, the quantum, quantum mechanics is not new, that's, that's certain. Um, but the application of quantum mechanics to, uh, to computing is, is quite new. Maybe, maybe not so new, but it's quite new. Um, and it's, it's, we are starting to talk about this uh, now so much because we have uh, got the first uh, experimental achievements in, in this direction. So the control that um, experimental, experimentalists have gained of qubits is unprecedented. So this, this hasn't been, been done before. And this is what brought a lot of hope in thinking that this theoretical idea, this, this illusion, this, this wonderful idea of, of using quantum mechanics for computation can actually become a reality. And we've already seen some uh, very interesting experiments done, by, for instance, by Google or by IBM. Um, IBM offers their devices on the cloud. Google has worked on these quantum supremacy experiments that they've been able to show an application, artificial applications that um, is um, runs in a quantum computer much faster than in a classical computer. And there have been other proofs of this same style in, in in, in China, uh, Jiawei Pen's group, and, and, and so on. So we are starting to see achievements that are actually showing the potential of this technology for the first time. So when is quantum computing going to actually be like part of our daily lives? So that's a very tricky question because first we need to understand for what application would that be useful? And that's that's the stage we are at now. So we are uh, focusing on the application side. Uh, but uh, we also need the development of hardware. And um, it is predicted that if we continue developing the hardware at the base we have for the last uh, decade, we, we can expect to have um, good enough hardware to develop some of the really foreseen applications of cryptography, of uh, factoring, and so on, in the next 10 years. So I would say that the time frame is 10 years to start seeing uh, quantum computing being around. Now, um, big data center, big supercomputing centers are already um, building this uh, and allocating resources to put their quantum computers, quantum prototypes in their centers. And this also, um, means that more people, more engineers, more scientists, more mathematicians, computer scientists will have access to them. And, and that means that new applications will, will, will pop up because it's, it's just a matter of, of making it uh, widely available to start seeing how people do the magic with them. Um, so I think we are, the next 10 years are going to be very interesting and I expect to see this implemented, implemented in the daily um, in our daily lives or, or at least in, in the next 10 years. What kind of applications are driving all this? Is it just cryptography and keeping everything secure or are there other cool industries that, you know, will really benefit from this? Well, cryptography is, is maybe was the first application that, that people and government, of course, and defense and so on, start showing interest in. But there are a lot of other applications that uh, will be very useful for, for the industry and, and also for education and research. So one of them that is very widespread in all the industries is optimization problems. So for instance, you have your logistics company that really needs to solve, which is the most efficient way to distribute the packages and the delivery people and the trucks and the bikes and so on in order to, to maximize efficiency, minimize the cost and, and increase client satisfaction at the end of the day. And just a small, uh, Increase in the efficiency of their algorithms really shows them big benefits uh, uh, in terms of revenue. Same happens with finance. Finance is all about optimizing uh, assets, portfolio optimization, and uh, a big margin of um, better efficiency in those algorithms also implies uh, big revenues 
for for banks and 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 for people working in finance. There's also um, many other applications in transportation, optimizing optim optimizing flight routes uh, uh, to reduce. Uh, uh, carbon emission and and optimize uh, electrical grids. Uh, there are optimization problems are very widespread in our daily lives and usually they are very big. And big optimization problems are not easy to solve with classical machines. They take a lot of time and a lot, a lot of resources. So quantum computing could be a very good candidate to efficiently solve them. And then of course research wise. Uh, we have a lot of problems that would change the way we, we do research on uh, quantum chemistry, in material science, like discovering new materials for, for several applications, in biology, protein folding, uh, study of genetics. All these problems that are very hard to compute uh, nowadays could potentially have an efficient algorithm uh, that runs in a quantum computer. Wow, I mean, it all just sounds so exciting. And, you know, it's incredible that you really are on the cutting edge of the development of this technology. Um, are we going to be living in a, a different world when this becomes part of daily life? Or, I mean, are we going to be able to ask and answer questions that we never dreamed of ever asking? I hope so. That's my hope. So for me, one of the most interesting applications is uh, the advancement of the understanding of nature. So can we profit this amazing uh, phenomena of nature that is quantum mechanics to actually better understand what's happening in, in nature, maybe uh, better understanding uh, how the universe works, better understanding how we can actually cure um, diseases that now we, we have no idea on how to tackle. And for me, this is the, this is the dream. And, and I, it's difficult to predict how far this is, gonna, this is gonna go. But for now, there's nothing indicating that uh, this is not gonna happen. So there's a lot of hopes put in, in that direction. Yeah, I mean, I must say, I heard recently this idea, you know, diamonds are made of carbon atoms um, and the idea that quantum computers can assist us in sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and turning it into diamonds is not actually impossible <laughs> um, just theoretically so the idea that you know quantum technologies might make that a reality um, doesn't seem too sci-fi mm. but I hope that you know um it will lead to a better world. Um, I guess it will definitely provide us with a lot more intelligence and understanding of the planet we live on and beyond, actually. Um, how does it feel for you? I mean, you've just studied so much to get to the point that you're at. What's it like for you personally working for a startup in this field and... It is very overwhelming in the sense that uh, there are many open questions. So it's sometimes I, I, I dream about working in a field that it has been almost everything invented and you just have to do your task and then you, you leave your office and that's it. And then you just start living your life. Um, it's difficult to disconnect from this. It's difficult to um, get your free space in your mind where you stop uh, thinking and wondering about this and that and, and this algorithm that we've been studying and this problem that we could maybe try to solve or why did we observe uh, what we see in the experiment. Uh, it, it's big, sometimes a bit obsessive, but I guess that this is what research is and this is um, something inherent to, to researchers. Um, being in a startup uh, at the moment so far it hasn't been that much, uh, fortunately it hasn't been that much different from being in academia in the sense that um, we have freedom in, 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 the, in exploring all, all what we want and, and this is very important when you do research, you need to be free to, to, to move around and have your creativity and your ideas. Uh, the main difference is that now you have to interact with clients and that you have to start asking yourself the question of what, what is this important for. And I think this is a good thing because um, this makes us put some focus 
on how we keep developing the technology, not for the sake of creativity and interest or, okay, let's try putting this and see what happens. It's not this anymore. It's, okay, we want to achieve this. How can we do it? And this changes the way of working very much, but in, in a good way. So it's not, it's not a, a bad thing at all. It's really striking that you are female in what is probably a very male-dominated industry. I mean, physics, computing. Um, I can only assume that you're one of few um, being female in this industry. Um, what's it been like for you and how do you navigate that and kind of stand strong in yourself amongst um, people that are not necessarily like you? Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important point. And I, I really like to uh, speak about this topic, so I could be probably talking about this for an hour. Um, it's, well, I guess it's, it's um, diversity is very important in, in, in all the fields. And um, when we don't have diversity, it means that somebody's feeling out of place. Um, and I felt that way many times and uh, some of my colleagues um, have also felt that way and it's something we really need to to, to try to change and, and, and make in general physics and, and, and STEM more inclusive and more easy to navigate for, for everybody. Uh, I, at the beginning I was, I could go to a conference and be one or one of the few female uh, in there, one physics uh, physics conferences, and now I've seen this changing. This is slowly changing, and I think it's very important to have um, to support each other and to also don't let. Um, it's difficult to talk about this topic. Actually, it's it's. I think it's important to to make sure that we don't allow certain things to happen at all. So be very drastic. Uh, with this and stop them from the very root and from the very first time, uh, especially in, in in academia where maybe there's been more uh, free space for things to happen without consequences. Uh, and and I think this is this is now changing, and we need to make sure that this keeps being the case, and we don't let uh, uh, things happen. Well, I must say that in speaking to you, I hear someone extremely intelligent and someone who is very comfortable with your accomplishment within the field and because of that substance that you have acquired through your own hard work um, you command authority um, and I, I hear that in you and um, you must command authority amongst your colleagues. Um, and I guess my question is, do you have advice for minorities going into the STEM world? Because, you know, often there's a lot of self-doubt. It's something I experienced as um, a mechanical engineer. There were no people like me. Um, what advice would you give to those individuals who want to be able to stand strong in themselves the way you are coming across as standing strong? Well, uh, uh, it's going to be an odd answer, but I'm going to explain why. Um, I, my advice is to be vulnerable, to show yourself as a vulnerable person and, and as a true person because uh, I'm vulnerable. And I want to show that because I think showing also shows an example. I have this big imposter syndrome all the time. Maybe maybe it doesn't look like that, but I, I, I feel like an imposter every day. And I self-doubt every day and every hour. And I feel uncomfortable around my peers. And I feel uncomfortable around uh, in any conference, in any talk, in anything I do. Um, but I learned that uh, trying to fake it doesn't help 
um, the best way of getting rid of it and create community and feel supported and get some good feedback that actually helps you get rid of this feeling is by showing yourself as, as you are. Say, okay, I feel insecure about this. Or, okay, I have this huge imposter syndrome. I don't feel I can do this. Or, and th then all of a sudden you start hearing the, okay, me too. And you see somebody else that you thought it was super strong and, and amazing and super confident then come in and say okay me too I actually feel like this all the time and this gives you some sense of um, community and, and support that helps you not feel that much alone because I think this happens very often almost everybody I had this conversation with always say okay I, I, I also felt like this at, at least some point in my life and and it's funny how we are trying to fake it and not show how, how we really are and this is not, I don't think this is, this is helping. So it's, I think it's very important to show your vulnerabilities and speak about them and, and help each other. Once somebody tells you um, their vulnerability, say, okay, I can, I can try to help you. Well, I must say what you have stated there just shows your innovation, not just on a technical front, um, but also kind of socially, because uh, your approach, I think, is exactly what is requ required to bring people together. And it's so beautiful that you are able to be authentically yourself in a area of technology that is so cutting edge and so um, advanced and is our future. Um, I just feel like your attitude, your knowledge, your area of expertise and, and what you're doing in the quantum field is really where everything should be heading. Um, kind Thank of you. On, a, on, a, on a physical kind of um, technical level, but also the way we should be thinking because I often really struggle with um, conversations about gender because I feel like actually society isn't like what it was 20 years ago where mm. gender was um, a topic. Today, it's not about gender. It's about the people doing the research and, and the work. And so you represent that. Um, but you've also been extremely inspiring as well at the same time. So it's like, thank you, thank you for everything you're doing because I'm so excited for you. I just think you're in such an amazing field um, and I can't wait to see what you do next um, and where your industry heads because um, it's just, I mean, it's just so exciting. And, uh, and thank you for being you as well because uh, just seeing you there um, with your knowledge and expertise is, I mean, it's amazing to think that you would feel like an imposter, but I, I get it. <laughs> I get where that comes from, but you truly are remarkable and it's been a real privilege to be able to speak with you today. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>